so the first thing we're going to do today is cover some spanakopita. Hopefully uh, you all received the recipes. I believe Arlene sent them out to you. Um, and those recipes you could follow to a T. I'm actually going to kind of walk you through it without using them. Um, we've, I've prepped everything or prepared everything. Um, so it's akin to the recipe, but uh, we like to teach uh, using re recipes as a reference, but not necessarily abiding by them constantly because you want to work with feel and uh, really understand the cooking process rather than regurgitating what's on a piece of paper. Uh, and also enjoy what you're doing and also be able to put your own spin on things. So um, with the Spanish copita, uh, the first thing I have done is I preset an oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit on convection. If you don't have convection, 375 degrees Fahrenheit is what you would want just on normal bake. Uh, essentially, there's a temperature difference on convection versus bake because of how it circulates in the oven, um, just so that you can have that preheating while I do my instructions so that it's uh, up to temperature. Um, so like Arlene said, my name is Stephanie White. I'm the chef and culinary manager for the Turner Farm Teaching Kitchen, if you haven't been out here. Uh, we are situated in Indian Hill, uh, and I'm in the teaching kitchen right now. Uh, my home kitchen does not look this nice. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're situated on an organic farm. It's about 220 acres. We farm on about seven. Uh, so these recipes are actually really great uh, because a lot of things are in season right now. It's the beginning of the summer, so a lot of things are coming on. Uh, right now we have tons of kale and uh, we will have spinach. It's coming on, but everybody's buying it. So I'm going to focus on using kale in our spinach cookie um, but what Spanakopita is, is actually a spinach pie. It's originally from Greece. And we're gonna make cute little triangles, um, but you could make them into a larger pie. I like doing the triangles because it's really fun to make them. You can make a, a large batch of them and freeze them so you don't have to cook it all at once. That's another great thing about making it sort of uh, more portable and uh, bite sized that it's great with dips and sides and you don't have to make it a big thing, but you can also make it all at once and then enjoy it multiple different times. So um, like Arlene said, just type in any questions that you have along the way. I'm happy to answer anything and pretty much everything about cooking, even if it's not about Mediterranean foods, if I can help, I'm happy to. So we're gonna kick off with the Spanish Um So I have done a little TV magic and I sauteed uh, my kale and spinach with the onions and garlic and a little olive oil already. Um, so I'm going to walk through the Spanish copia. So if you haven't done that yet and you're cooking along, feel free to do that. I just didn't want to have to move my computer a bunch. Uh, but basically what I've done is just I put it in a saute pan with some olive oil. I uh, already have my onions and garlic and my greens cut before you start cooking uh, so that it's all ready to go right as soon as your pan is hot so nothing burns. Uh, and all you're doing is you're looking for the onions to get nice and soft and translucent. Uh, it should smell really good as well. It shouldn't be brown or browning, but if it does, it's not a problem. And then you're gonna throw in your greens with the garlic last minute and just really mix it into the saute pan so it wilts a little bit. You don't have to cook the spinach until it's like Popeye spinach where it's just a thimble from a whole pound. So um, that's what you're gonna do if you haven't done it and you're cooking along. If not, um, that's our saute. Uh, center part of our spanakopita and it's very classic to have feta so I've got some local feta that's crumbled up um, you can actually make spanakopita without the feta but it is a classic ingredient uh, and I was like joking that feta is the cheese that tastes feta uh, it's got a, a ton of brine because it's a brine cheese so um, when you're seasoning your greens if you're gonna add uh, feta try not to over salt it because the feta is gonna bring some saltiness to the filling as well and all I'm doing is using some tongs to mix it together. So I've got my filling ready to go, and it's a little cool, but um, it can you can work with it if it's hot, if you're sauteing along. So um, I like doing the Spanish poke dough because a lot of people are intimidated by phyllo. Uh, you could make phyllo dough by hand, um, but it's not uh, the easiest thing to do, and you can find this in the freezer section at pretty much any grocery store. This one I got from Whole Foods. Um, but Kroger does also have it, so uh, it's pretty easily um, accessible. If not, you could, um, well, there's not a lot of things that are similar to feel. You could make it by hand, but it'll take a long time. Uh, what you could do instead is use a filling uh, to make a regular pie or like an empanada. So you could 
um, kind of make a fusion dish if you can't find the phyllo and wanted to use a pie crust instead or something like that. It's not the same thing, but work with what you got. So uh, the phyllo is usually in the freezer section. I pulled it out of my freezer last night uh, so that it could uh, come up to temperature in the refrigerator. Don't leave it out on the counter overnight. Uh, if it is still frozen, just leave it out on your counter for a half an hour and then it'll be workable. Okay. So, um, but don't unwrap it until you're ready to work with it because it'll start drying out. They're very thin sheets of pastry, basically. So um, they're very lean. All it is is flour, water, uh, and salt. So leave it in its packaging until you're ready to uh, make some spag cookie dough. So in this process, I'm actually gonna tilt my computer. Uh, so you might not be able to see my face, but you'll be able to see the work surface. And I think it's super important that you see how I'm making these. Uh, and it would actually be a great time if we have a question. I see that our chat has a um, talking point on it. So I'm gonna adjust my screen just so you guys can see my work surface. Uh, and then we're gonna start to shape the Spanish cookie dough so you can see how that process goes. That's good. Awesome. So I'm just unwrapping this. And Arlene, can you see what that, if it, uh, that is a question or it's just chatter? In the chat box, it's just a comment from Genevieve. I think it was regarding Philo Doe being intimidating because she just, she just typed in yes. Yes, yeah, it definitely is. Um, we do hands-on Mediterranean classes, you know, pre-pandemic pretty often. And it's one of those things that um, I always cover because it can be so intimidating and um, really challenging to work with if you uh, are too uh, slow with it or are too afraid. Don't be afraid. It's going to fall apart, but that's kind of part of its flakiness. Um, so, and I'll rip and tear some of these phyllo sheets so you can see that I'm not afraid of it falling apart. It's okay. It's part of the process. Uh, so yeah, we've got our phyllo. I've unwrapped it, but it's still wrapped up in a cup ring. So what I'm going to do is unroll it. It'll look a lot like very thin sheets of paper. And let me pull one up. I usually like to pull it from the side or one of the edges, just like pulling up a piece of paper. And see, it already ripped. It's not a big deal. We're gonna cut them and shape them anyway. So uh, you can see how pliable it is right now. And that's why it's super important when you're not working with it to cover it either with a tea towel or um, plastic wrap or something like that so it doesn't dry out because it'll get very brittle very fast. So what I'm gonna do is actually just take a few of these sheets and hopefully you can also see I have a baking tray with parchment on it. You wanna get one of those ready if you don't already have that ready. Um, and if you don't have parchment, it's not a big deal. You can do it straight on the sheet tray or you can use foil. Um, just don't use wax paper, it's a bad idea. So uh, what I'm gonna do is clear the space because what I'm gonna do is we're gonna layer sheets of phyllo and we're gonna put a little bit of olive oil in between the layers so it gets nice and flaky and crispy. So I wanna move this stuff over and uh, I've got a nice clean work surface. Everything's been wiped down before and now it's dry because you don't want to work with the dough while your surface is wet. So I'm going to pick one sheet up and I'm going to get that other side of that sheet as well. So we've got one sheet on the work surface and we're going to drizzle it with olive oil. If you don't have it in a squeeze bottle already, um, you could brush it on or you can kind of just throw it on. It doesn't have to be perfectly brushed on. I wrote the recipe saying brushed, but as long as it's kind of sporadically around, you're okay. And I'm also going to use a little bit of salt and just season it. You can also season the layers with other spices like smoked paprika or cumin. Um, it's just an added level to it. You can even use some thyme or other herbs and really get the flavor in between the layers as well, but it's not necessary. So we're going to keep it basic. Um, so from here, yeah. Can you tell us again what brand of dough you're using? Yeah, so I'm using Philo. Sometimes you'll see it as F-H-Y-L-L-O or F-I-L-L-O, and this is from the Philo factory. Let me not put it upside down. Um, there are a couple different brands out here, out, you know, at, at Kroger's and Whole Foods. This one is relatively affordable. Sometimes Whole Foods has more expensive brands, um, but it's pretty much the same regardless. So, you know, use your own common sense with 
the economic choice on there. Uh, so the fuel factory is the one that I normally use. Yeah. So we're going to grab another sheet. So I'm picking it up with my hands. And if it falls apart, that's okay. So we've got another layer just on top of the other one. And just a little another drizzle or brush oil. It doesn't have to be everywhere. And you could season every layer, um, but it might get a little too salty if you're gonna use salt all that much. So I just do it on one layer and that's pretty much good. And we're gonna do one more layer. So we lift that up and I'm gonna intentionally tear this one and throw it all over the place. So you can see that we can also just do some patchwork. You don't, if it starts to fall apart like this, it's not a big deal. We're gonna be folding it up and shaping it anyway. The point is to create layers. So there, that's, a, that's the last one. So with the other filo that I'm not working with just yet, um, we could do all of it, but we'd be here for a little while. So you're welcome to continue that if you're cooking along. Um, but I just wanted to show everybody and then have it recorded if you want to keep doing it, that's cool. Um, but so that we don't waste the rest of our filo, I'm gonna roll it back up and make sure that is covered in that plastic so it does not dry out. And because I don't wanna to move too far away, I'm just gonna cover it with a tea towel right now. Um, but if for some reason you start working on some spanakopita and you don't wanna use all of it or you get sidetracked, you can put it in a Ziploc bag and put it in the refrigerator or refreeze it. Uh, that being said, it might get a little bit brittle if you're uh, freezing it and thawing it, freezing it, thawing it, but it is an option if you don't want to use all of it. Uh, and if you get comfortable with phyllo, Spanish cook is actually more difficult than baklava. Uh, and I'm actually happy to send my baklava recipe to Arlene and she can send it out to all of you. But it's the same thing. You just do it in a, a 9 by 13 pan and just do the layers and then you put the nut filling in, do more layers, nut filling, more layers on top. Uh, and I like to do a zigzag pattern on top, just cutting it, and then you bake that off and you have baklava. Um, normally what I do once it's baked is you drizzle it with a honey or simple syrup mixture, but that, that's it. So once you get comfortable with phyllo, you can do tons of different dishes. Same thing with spanakopita. You can do other fillings. It won't be called spanakopita anymore, but you can work with phyllo in different ways. Uh, that way when you buy the phyllo, you don't feel like you just have to do one recipe. There's a bunch of different things you can do. So um, I, I think there might be questions, otherwise it might be just still a flag from uh, me not poking at it. But what I'm gonna do is cut them into strips so that we can make those cute little triangles. If anybody's ever made origami or folded uh, a flag before, it'll be a very simpler folding process. Uh, so I wanna make them into, I'm gonna do about an inch and a half um, little ribbons, but you can also do it lengthwise and make them larger. Uh, I, I believe I wrote the recipe to say that you do five of them, you want to go lengthwise if you want to cut them into five. I'm actually going to make them smaller, a little cuter. So I'm going to take my knife and I can cut on my work surface because it's granite. Make sure that your work surface is cuttable on. Otherwise use a cutting board. Just pick it up and transfer it. I don't want you to ruin your countertop. So from here, I'm just going to cut a straight line. You could also use a pizza cutter if you're intimidated by using a knife. And I'm making these actually kind of big, but you can make them as thin or as thick as you like. So from here, we've got strips. And you don't need to pick them up, I'm just showing you that basically one is like this. If it starts to fall apart, it's okay. We're still gonna use it. So I've got my filling right next to me and I've got our strips. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is take about a tablespoon worth the filling and put it at one end. And if you make them smaller strips, you want less filling if you make them bigger, more filling. Um, but what I'm gonna do is take one of the edges and I'm gonna fold it over so it's like a triangle. I'm gonna lift it up so everybody can see. So right now it's a triangle. And essentially I'm gonna keep folding it up to maintain that tight triangle. So fold it up and over, up and over and over. So I've done this a lot, so that's why it looks pretty good. If it doesn't look this great the first couple tries, don't worry. They're still gonna be delicious, okay? So once I have it nice and folded up, I'm just gonna put it on that sheet tray with parchment so that I have a nice surface to put it on. 
And at this point, once you make all of or however many you want, you could freeze it. Um, but we're, what we're going to do is put them in the oven so that they can bake while we do other things. So I'm going to do the rest of these so you can see the whole process. So I'm taking some filling, about a tablespoon, maybe a little bit more. So I start with one corner. I usually always start with the left and go up towards the right, but it's just habit, whichever way works for you. From there, lift up, turn, up, over, up, over, try. So again, this strip was a little bit wider because I didn't cut consistently and that's okay. So I'm gonna put a little bit more filling. And if it's not totally cut through, that's okay. You can always run your knife through again or rip it. So I'm taking that left corner, turning it over, up, over, up, over, up, and over. So another triangle. All right. So uh, if you guys have any questions about Spanakopita, that's sort of the process. You could also do it in a nine by 13 pan and or even a pie pan and just layer it that way and stick the filling in the center and then just cover it with phyllo. Um, these are relatively impressive, but they're also cute and portable. Um, not that that's a determinant with food all the time, but it's just a different way to present Spanakopita. So, and, and it's not traditional to have kale in it. We're using kale because it's local and in season right now, um, but you could use other greens besides spinach. You could use Swiss chard greens. You could use a combination. Uh, collards are a little tough unless you're gonna braise them beforehand, um, but you can use beet greens. There's a bunch of different greens that come out at different times of the year, so you can really mix and match as you want. And I've got one last one. And this little guy you could fold up, but it would be super small. If you want, I can do that just to show you, but it's the same thing, just a lot less filling. So this last one, pop it over. And I've had to do this a lot in my life. I used to work for a caterer that made hundreds of these at a time. So if it takes you a while to feel comfortable, that is perfectly okay. And it's just a process. So for some reason, I'm just gonna show you a really tiny one just so we can use all of this phyllo. And I think this would be too small for anybody to really enjoy, but we have it, so we might as well. So now that we've got those all shaped, they still have a little bit of oil on them, um, but I'm just gonna drizzle just a little bit more because some of them appear to be a little dry. So from there, you can also season them a little bit on top as well. So I'm gonna take a little bit of kosher salt and I like to season from above so that it distributes on the food more evenly. And I'm gonna pop it into an oven uh, that's been preheated and we're gonna cook it until it's golden brown and crispy. Uh, the filling is already cooked so we're not waiting for internal temperature or anything like that. If you wanted to do a meat filling, that would be a little difficult or different, not difficult. Uh, but for here, we're just trying to get it nice and crispy on the outside and also warm on the inside. So since we just made these, it'll probably take a half an hour, but if you're taking them from freezer to oven, you don't have to thaw them or anything, but they'll take a little bit longer. So off they go. All right, so I'm gonna adjust this and we're gonna move on to making some tabbouleh, uh, which is traditionally used, uh, or traditionally made with bulgur wheat, uh, but we're gonna do quinoa. And I've already cooked the quinoa uh, simply because the recipe already says that it's cooked in there, I believe, if I remember what I wrote. Uh, if not, uh, feel free to cook the quinoa. It shouldn't take you more than uh, 15 to 20 minutes, depending on if you've already got your pan ready and all, all set to go. So I'm gonna grab all of my ingredients. And you'll notice I've had these recipes kind of set up in trays. Uh, it is a good practice, not just for demonstrations like this, but it's good in your own home to get everything ready to go and prepared. It's called mise en place, um, which also means having um, the right pots and pans in place. It means everything in its place. And that way, when you go to actually cook something, everything is set to go uh, and it's a much smoother process. So I recommend uh, trying to incorporate that into your life regardless of if it's tabbouleh 
or um, some egg dinner, you know. So uh, I'm just gonna kind of walk through all the ingredients that I have. So this is the quinoa that's already cooked. I've just got it in a container. We've got some parsley. It's a little sad because the kitchen is warm. Um, I just harvested some mint from, we have some whiskey barrels that have mint in them outside. Uh, they don't have whiskey in them, unfortunately. But uh, the mint is beautiful. If you want to grow mint, it's very easy to take care of. However, if you don't like mint, don't plant it because it will pretty much always come back and take over everything. So it's something to consider. We've got some limes, some garlic, and then I've also got some beautiful radishes that are in season right now. Uh, if you couldn't find any of the ingredients, that's okay. Uh, you can always kind of change and manipulate the recipe. Like uh, I actually couldn't find because of the pandemic, just normal frozen peas. So I had to get the frozen peas with the carrots and that's okay. It's gonna be delicious. So um, just know that you can always change and modify recipes as needed. So I'm gonna grab a bowl really quick. And uh, I am taking a lot of time. So what I'm gonna do is kind of just walk through this one really quick. Basically all we're doing is prepping the ingredients, putting it in a bowl and mixing it together. Um, and tasting it is super important as well. So the quinoa, I'm just gonna put in the bowl and get ready. Um, so like I mentioned before, tabbouleh, I'm gonna also put some salt in it, is normally with bulgur wheats, uh, but this is a nice gluten-free option. The other thing is that uh, quinoa has lovely protein in it, so it's bulgur wheat, but quinoa a little bit more so, so it's, it's a nice filling um, substitute. So the mint really quick, uh, you could chop it, but what I'm gonna do is just tear it off because I like uh, nice leafy bits in my tabbouleh. Uh, tabbouleh is actually more of an herb salad, but people think of it as a grain salad. Uh, so for the mint, I'm just gonna hold it from the top and then take my thumb and my forefinger and pull down. And that way it's a little bit easier to take off. So I've got lovely leaves. If they're really big, you can just rip and tear. So once again, I'm holding it from the top. I've already washed this, so make sure you wash your produce first and pull down. If it breaks, that's okay. You can just pull it off and try it again. So rip and tear, rip and tear. Lovely. So get a little bit more mint in there. And this is one of those things where you can add more or less, totally up to you. You can use a ton of mint and no parsley. Uh, parsley is pretty traditional in Spanish coconut, or not Spanish coconut, tabule, um, but you can totally manipulate it and change it if you want. I've got some scallions already cut up. I'm going to show you how to cut those scallions in a different recipe, so you didn't, I didn't think you needed to watch it all the time. The frozen thawed peas, don't, don't throw them in frozen because you want to enjoy that. Uh, and then the parsley, I've already washed it. And uh, what I'm going to do is clean up the ends, but I like to actually use most of the parsley. So what I do is I fold it up into a nice little bundle. And how I hold my knife really quick, just in case anybody needs to see it, is I use my thumb and my forefinger to pinch between the blade and the handle. And then what I'm going to do is use a rocking motion to cut through the parsley. I'm gonna keep my fingers pulled back, sometimes called a bear claw. So from here, I'm gonna just cut through. And Get it in the bowl. So from there, we're gonna season it with a little bit of lime and get some garlic in there as well and some olive oil as I throw my citrus. Uh, all I'm gonna do is zest it. I like the zest because there's tons of essential oils in there and you really get the vibrancy, uh, but it's, it's not necessary if you just have lemon juice or lime juice and you don't actually have whole lemon or lime, that's fine as well. So with the zester, I'm gonna hold it over the bowl so that all of the zest goes straight into the salad, and I get all of the lovely essential oils directly into the salad. And on the back side, I'm gonna tap it a little bit. Stephanie? Yes. Um, Bethany asks, if you can't find mint, do you have any ideas for a substitute? For a substitute. So you can either leave it out if you can't find it. Basil is a really lovely one, and uh, is usually able to find it. Uh, pretty much any soft herb is fine. Uh, to substitute for it just depends on if you like the flavor. So ones that I would stay away from would be like thyme or rosemary or sage because they're kind of hearty and may not eat very well with the salad, but um, basil would be a great replacer. If you like cilantro, you could add cilantro. Um, you could also just add more scallion and add more parsley. 
uh, so it's up to you, but basil is a really good replacement for mint. So really quick, I'm gonna uh, juice these uh, lemons, so I'm just gonna cut it in half. And if you are worried about getting seeds into your salad, you can flip over the grate or the grater and you can squeeze the juice over it so that you don't end up with the seeds inside of the bowl. Or you can just juice it somewhere else. Uh, it's just not fun picking out the seeds. So we're gonna squeeze that in. And what we're gonna also need is a little bit of garlic. And I put in some radishes into the recipe as well. It's not traditional. Traditionally, uh, tabbouleh also has cucumber and tomato, but it's not quite season in season yet. Uh, and I really I love tomatoes and cucumbers, but they're uh, and we'll use a cucumber later. But tomatoes aren't the greatest when they're not in season, so we're kind of making a springtime tabbouleh version. So I've got my citrus in there. I'm just gonna thinly slice my garlic. I've already peeled it and I'm gonna take off that little brown ends and I'm gonna thinly slice it and just roughly chop it. Um, you could also put this into a food processor if you really wanted to. So it's totally up to you. Just try to keep your fingers out of the way. So I put my hand flat on the top and then I just chop through. They don't have to be perfectly minced because nobody's going to critique if they're perfect, besides the fact that uh, it's going to all go to the same place. And we're not really cooking this. Uh, usually when you're cutting something consistently, uh, it's also for visual feel and mouth feel, but um, it's super important when cooking that you cut things consistently because it'll, that way it cooks consistently. But since this is a salad, we just want to make sure it's nice and fine. So from there, uh, what we have left is some radishes. So what I'm going to do is take the greens off. You could use the greens. Some radishes actually have uh, kind of hairy greens and it's not great to eat. Uh, but these are actually really nice and lovely, so it's up to you if you want to use them or not. So I'm just taking off the tops. And uh, if you want, you can clean up the, the roots as well. And you just want to be mindful of where your fingers are because they're small and round. Uh, so the first thing I like to do is just cut it in half so you have a flat surface. Whenever you're cutting something round, you wanna make sure that it has a flat surface. You have more space to cut it and less chance of it rolling around on you. So from here, I'm gonna turn this down so you can see the cut a little bit more. Um, so we actually have slightly differently shaped radishes, but this one is uh, pretty small. So I'm gonna thinly slice it. You could also wedge them if you prefer to keep your fingers out of the way. You could also use a mandolin, but just be very careful of your fingers there because um, plenty of people get very uh, comfortable with mandolins and then they accidentally kick their finger with them and that's not really what you want in your salad. So we've got our rashes cut. And if you're uh, you know, cooking along, take your time. You don't have to cut as fast as me. Uh, I just figured you didn't need to watch me just cut things. So I moved my spoon over here. So we're gonna mix that all together and it's gonna be really bright and green. And the carrots <laughs> bring a little bit of orange to it that it normally wouldn't, but that's quite all right. We're gonna add a little bit of salt. I'm gonna add a little bit of black pepper since I have it and just a little bit of olive oil. Mix that together. This is a great salad, uh, especially on beautiful sunny days like today, um, but it's great for packing if you're on the go, not that most of us are on the go right now, but it's something to consider. Um, so what I always do too is taste. Um, I ideally don't eat it over the bowl like this unless you're the only one eating it. Uh, but from here, I'm gonna take a little bit and I'm gonna taste it and make sure that it has enough acidity, enough salt, if I like how much mint is in it or scallion, um, so you always want to evaluate your food before you either uh, eat more of it or um, serve it to someone else. And it's good. Um, I think some people might want a little bit more salt in it, but I actually like a little less. I like acidity a lot more than salt. So for me, that's good. And I'm going to place it to the side um, so that we can kind of plate it up a little bit later. But feel free to 
play and adjust the seasoning on it the way you like it. That's the great thing about cooking for either yourself or for others is that you have control of it. We're going to make a yogurt dip. So we're moving on to our dips, and they're going to be pretty fast. So for the tzatziki, it's a yogurt and cucumber dip. So I've got some um, semi-local yogurt. And uh, we've got a cucumber, and I've got a grater set up. I've already grated what I needed, but I just wanted to show you how I grate things. So I've got a grater. You could also use a food processor if you have that. Uh, connection or that um, attachment in it, um, but what I'm just going to do is grate it this way. Make sure that your cucumber is washed beforehand and that your pans are clean. We're just going to grate it. Uh, yes, farro would work. I saw that pop up. Uh, you can use any grain that you want. Uh, I like the quinoa just because uh, I enjoy the flavor of it, but really you can, you could use farro, you could use wild rice, whatever you want. As long as it's cooked and you enjoy it, that's what matters. So I'm sure many of you have grated cucumber or maybe grated something else before, um, but that's what you would do for the cucumber. If you end up with a weird bit at the end uh, that you don't want to grate because it's too close for your fingers, you could snack on it or do something else with it. So we've got some grated cucumber and we're gonna need to slice up some garlic, got our yogurt, uh, this is where we're going to need our scallions. So I'm going to cut it on a bias, and what that means is at, at a 45 degree angle. So I'm going to take the root ends off first, because we don't want to eat those, and I'm going to clean up the tops. I have already washed my scallions, but if you need to do that, you should probably do that. Uh, so from here, I like to use both the white and the green part. A lot of chefs will use green parts just for garnish, and then the white parts uh, when cooking, but I find that I really enjoy the flavors of both, but sometimes the white part can be very harsh for some people. So, uh, you know, trust your, your palate. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I've got my stallions kind of on an angle and I'm going to cut on an angle and I'm gonna use a rocking motion to keep my fingers out of the way to create that on a bias. And you can make them chunkier or thin, it's totally up to you, you can also just Cut straight along, you don't have to do it on a bias. So from there, we're gonna put that in the bowl. We'll do one more or two more just to show you. So root end off, clean up the tops, and on an angle. So we're gonna cut these scallions. I'm also going to rough chop some of this garlic, you don't need all of it. Put a lot on my tray, but if you love garlic, you can use as much as you'd like. So I've already peeled these, but I'm gonna take that little brown end off. Kind of cut this one in half just so it has a flat surface, and then I'm gonna thinly slice it. And then the other thing we need for this dish is some mint, which I've shown you how to kind of rip and tear. Um, if you do want to thinly slice it, I've got some mint here, so I'm going to take it off the, the leaves. You can pull it off like that if you want. I like to stack it up into one pile, and you can actually roll it up so it's much easier to cut all at once, so it's not all over the, the place. And I'm going to thinly slice it just to show you, and that cut is called a chiffonade. If you want to be in culinary school, uh, it's very thin and very fine, but a rough chop is perfectly fine. So from here, I'm gonna put that in the bowl as well. And it looks like there's a question, I'm happy to take it. There's also some cumin that goes in, so I'm just gonna throw the cumin that I have into the bowl as well. Stephanie, Lynn is asking, how do you handle the membrane on scallions? On scallions. So that I don't get clean cut. So um, sometimes if they're really slippery, I'll actually take that off first because it can be kind of dangerous if it's slipping everywhere. If it's just wet, just um, take a clean paper towel and wipe it that way. Sometimes that helps with the membrane if it's a little slimy. Um, otherwise, try to only cut one at a time. If it's, uh, it seems like when you do multiple, that's really where it slips. The other really important thing, it's, it might not be the scallion, it might actually be how sharp your knife is. So make sure that your knife is really sharp and that should also help. Um, so we've got the scallions, the mint, some garlic and also some cumin in this bowl. We're also gonna add in the cucumber. 
And then not all of this yogurt, but about, I believe I wrote three cups in. And you can make it more yogurty or less yogurty. And I've got a spatula here. Uh, and we're gonna season it also with a little bit of salt, maybe some black pepper. You can also add in some olive oil if you want it thinner. But it's a really bright, fresh, that's some salt, just so you know what I'm grabbing, a little bit of black pepper. And that's the yogurt dip. You can actually make it a couple days in advance, just um, be cautious that it might look like it's separated a little bit from the cucumber. Um, just whisk it back together. And it's great chill. Um, so if you want to make it in advance and just leave it in your refrigerator, that's perfect. Um, so I've got a serving tray or a serving bowl for this just so I can show you what it looks like in a bowl, but I'm sure many of you know what food looks like in a bowl. But um, I'm gonna put it into here so that when we go to kind of present everything that we've made, it has a nice lovely little dish. And if you have extras, just make sure that you pack it in the refrigerator um, and save it for a, a time when you get to enjoy it. So I'm gonna put these to the side. And really quick, we're gonna check on the Spanish cookie dough. And they're starting to get brown, but they're not quite there yet. So I'm gonna show everybody where mine are. So they're starting to get golden brown, but I want them golden brown all the way around. So I'm gonna pop those back in. Make sure you use a kitchen towel or something so that you don't burn your hand while checking. And uh, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna make some hummus and tahini sauce. Uh, so all we're going to do is put those ingredients in a blender. It's very easy. Um, hummus is something that uh, I feel that most people really love, uh, and it's very easy to put together, um, but we sometimes spend too much money on the stuff that's pre-made. So I'm going to use traditional uh, chickpeas, and we're using canned chickpeas. Just make sure you rinse them off first. Um, but you could start them from dried beans if, uh, if you have them and if you have the time. If you're in a pinch and really just want to make a dip really quickly, uh, then you're gonna wanna use cans, uh, just because cooking beans sometimes takes a long time, especially if you're gonna soak them overnight, and I don't think we wanna wait till tomorrow to make this hummus. So what I've done is take, I've taken my chickpeas out of the can and rinsed them already, so if you haven't done that, you might wanna do that. And so we've got our tahini as well. So we've got the chickpeas. I'm gonna try to show everybody I've got a kitchen or a blender or a food processor, whatever you have. You can either use a blender or a food processor. I find that for the hummus, it makes it a little bit easier to use a food processor. Um, but we've got our chickpeas. You could also use black beans or pinto beans or white beans to play with the flavors and play with what you have as well. We've got some tahini, um, which is sesame seed paste. It's very similar to peanut butter, but made with sesame seeds instead. Um, and it's a little bit thinner as well. Uh, I've got some lemon juice, but uh, if you don't have already pre-squeezed lemon juice, uh, I do like to use the organic uh, lemon juice that's just lemon juice, because sometimes those weird little lemon bottles that they sell doesn't actually have much lemon in it. So uh, I try to get the good stuff if I'm gonna have it on hand, but you could just squeeze some lemons as well. And I've also got some garlic already peeled, and we've got our olive oil here, and we'll have some salt as well. And um, if you need water, you can use water to thin it out as well. So we've got our food processor. We've already got the blade in. I like garlic, so I'm gonna throw two cloves in, but you can add more or less. We're gonna add in the chickpeas. And you can follow the measurements if you want. Otherwise, you can just kind of throw the stuff together and taste it and make sure that you like the seasoning. So that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna throw in some tahini. It's about a third of a cup that I just threw in there and lemon juice, just a splash. I do like my hummus, pretty uh, citrusy, just because I like that flavor, so use more or less, depending on if you like it. And then I'm just gonna squeeze in some olive oil as well. And hummus is also a great spread on sandwiches and things like that, so it doesn't have to be just a dip. I'm gonna put that on. I'm also going to season it with a little bit of salt. I have a hole on the top of this, so I'm just gonna put it in like that. I'm gonna let it process. So some people like it thicker, and some people like it thinner. So you find it. We're gonna let that process, but just in case you didn't hear me, some people like their hummus thicker, and some people like it thinner. It's totally up to you. 
Um, some other flavors you can add, like this is pretty thick right now, so I am going to add some water to it. Um, but we could also taste it and see if it needs more tahini, needs more lemon juice, needs more salt, or even more olive oil. So I'll probably add some water and a little bit of olive oil because I feel like it, and it's right here. Um, another thing you can add to hummus, you could do roasted red bell peppers, you could throw in kalamata olives, so you can flavor it the way you want. Uh, in a way that you can also like fla flavor mayonnaise in any way that you want. So uh, it can be a spread or a dip. If it's a dip, you want it thinner. Another way that you can thin it while it's spinning is as long as you have the open space at the top, you can have it processing and add in water or olive oil or the lemon juice as it's on. I just didn't want to taste it while it's on in the pan. relatively thin, um, but some people like it thicker. So I'm going to taste it. Make sure I like it. You don't want to plate it up and then not enjoy it. And it's pretty good. Mine needs a little bit of salt and also a little bit of lemon juice. I'm going to process that really quick. And then we're going to put it into a bowl. Hummus. We're going to put it into this bowl and get it all plated up as well. And the tahini dip is quintessentially the same process. We're just going to put all of the ingredients into the food processor. I'm going to use a different bowl because uh, this one's dirty, uh, but you could just rinse this out if you wanted to, uh, just for expediency. I'm going to change up the bowl. So I've got my hummus here. Some people like to take a spoon and do a swoosh on top and drizzle in olive oil, or what you can do is take some paprika and just sprinkle it on top. So you can get kind of fancy with how you serve it, if that's something you want to do. Um, but we're going to make the tahini dip really quick, and then everything should be ready to go. I'm sorry that I'm taking more time then. Is that okay, Arlene? All right, just making sure that uh, if anybody needs to go, it's, it's being recorded. So um, just make make sure you do what you need to do with your life. So uh, we've got the food processor with a blender. I've got a little bit of garlic. Since this is a tahini sauce, there's gonna be more tahini in this one than in the garlic, or in the hummus. And we've got a bunch of tahini in the bowl. Some lemon juice. We're gonna add in some cumin as well. And olive oil. And this you can actually use as a dressing as well. You can thin it out and use it on like a kale salad would be really lovely that way. Or you can drizzle it on falafel or you can use it as a dip for the tzvani kopita. So you can really uh, use it for a lot of different things. Uh, so I'm just gonna turn this on and we might need a little bit of water. So I've got my water ready to go as well. And that's the top part that I was telling you. Uh, make sure they don't, you don't accidentally pour the water into that instead of into the food processor. Uh, because it will go very fast. So we're going to taste that really quick. And it should be a nice thin sauce. You, can make, you could make it thicker if you wanted to, just by making sure that you added a ton of tahini. And that's good. Mine is a little too lemony. So if it ends up being too lemony, what you can do is add a little bit of salt. So things um, as far as like saltiness and acidity uh, and sweetness, they all balance, eat, balance each other out. So you can uh, really change the flavor depending on what you like. Um, so if you have too much acidity, adding a little bit of salt will definitely help with that. Even just using a little bit of olive oil is going to spread it out more so that it's not as aggressive. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can season foods. Uh, and it's not just for the dips. So we put that back on. So we're gonna taste this one more time. And that's much better. So we're gonna put that also in a bowl. And I'm gonna clean up a little bit because this to me is a hot mess. And uh, I like things nice and clean. 
so that I can think clearly. And that way too, you have less to clean up later. I'm gonna put that Perfect. So we're gonna get this sauce also into a bowl or dip. All right. spoon. So we've got our dips ready to go. Put the spanakopita on that lovely tray and some of the tabbouleh in this bowl so you can see. It's a lovely little kind of appetizer-y midday treat or maybe a late lunch depending on where you're at. Beautiful. So, it's nice and golden brown. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, make sure that you put the hot sheet tray on top of plastic. That would not be good. Um, I'm gonna grab some tongs really quick. You could grab it with your hands, but they're hot, so you might wanna consider not doing that. So, we've got the lovely spanakopita cute tiny one we'll <laughs> put on the tray too. We've got those ready to go. Uh, and you might want to let them cool down a little bit before you tuck into them because um, they'll be very hot in the center. But those are the dishes. So hopefully you all can see it. Uh, they're all, they come together all relatively quickly. Um, it just depends on how comfortable you are with a knife and um, you know how quickly you move. Uh, so if it takes you a little bit longer, that is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and these will all last a few days. The dips will last a little bit longer, but the tabbouleh is something you kind of want to enjoy day of, but you could do it the night before and the day before. Uh, and the spanakopita, you can make it one day and freeze it. So uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the little mini class, long class at this point. Um, but I'm happy to take questions or anything like that. Otherwise, it's been a real pleasure uh, and hopefully you all get to enjoy these recipes.